Why power solar water heating systems with solar electricity? My name is Barry Johnston from Solar Twin. I've been asked to record this for Solar Twin viewers on YouTube. So I'm sitting in the train from Edinburgh to Chester doing just that. Is it a sensible thing to do? What's the context of actually changing over from mains powered pumping and control of solar hot water to solar electric pumping? And what's the points in favour? It's against and where's the future? Here's a typical solar installation with Solar Twin on it, a large solar thermal panel and in the far corner the photovoltaic panel that powers the pump and the controller. We'd say that photovoltaically powered solar water heating is a sensible thing to do and it should be mainstream very quickly. And here's the context and here's the evidence. Let's start with an understanding of this simple technology. Take the existing plumbing of a house, add a pipe, plumb that up to the solar panel via a pump. That small pump is powered by a photovoltaic panel plumb it back into the top of the hot water cylinder and lo and behold there you have hot water stored on cold, stratified and ready to be used at your convenience. It's safe, simple, easy to install. The context is re-evaluating the idea of efficiency in solar thermal, moving away from limited concepts of efficiency to a wider, more environmental one and understanding the difference between zero carbon and low carbon solar because there are different types and putting a figure on this difference in terms of carbon emissions to see if the difference is really worth having. There are various different narrow perspectives on efficiency. If you can buy the smallest or cheapest solar heating system, you can try and get as much efficiency per square metre out of your solar panel, even though the roof area might be limiting, and that can often lead you to require fat pipes, big pumps, lots of heat exchanges, and that sort of thing. Some people buy the hottest panels, they can go up to 200 Celsius, um, not very comfortable to bath in. Some people will specify dedicated solar volumes, which for months at a time in winter may not be heated by backup heating, so they may have a Legionella problem. Our view is to look wider, to try to flatten the annual performance of a solar panel so that you minimise your backup, particularly in winter, because what you want to do is to maximise the solar fraction. The portion of your energy bill that solar will displace, you end up barking up the wrong tree if you're not careful. So we're trying to minimise your bills and also trying to maximise the response to hot water demand. With Solar Twin, if we have the choice on a new build, we'll often put it on a south-facing wall because that will give you a bit of extra winter gain at the expense of a summer excess quite often. But also we want to look at the environmental cost benefits, long life, low environmental impact, and not have an operational carbon clawback. And it's this issue which is going to be partially the subject today to actually look at why conventional solar really damages its break-even on carbon by being plugged into the mains. We're going to be looking as far as we can at whole-of-life carbon budgets. In order to do this, you need to start stepping back and then looking at the concept of life cycle analysis. And there are ways in which you can break down the carbon emissions of a business. You can waste energy or you you can say that when you make them you can do the same thing, transporting similarly, installing, particularly using and servicing and then of course disposing of them. To run that sort of business you want to minimise travel, that's what we do at Solar Twin. We sell our solar panels by phone rather than by driving around. We make lightweight products, travel as little as possible, install in one trip, design them with as little carbon operation in their lives as possible, long service intervals so people aren't driving around emitting carbon to sort things out and then to reuse or recycle at the end of their life. Are figures available? We've got them for the two major areas for making them and using them. Solar Twin carbon payback is under two years according to Bath University's independent study on Solar Twin photovoltaics and microwind. For photovoltaics, the time is about seven years to pay back, and for microwind, it varies enormously depending on where you site your turbine. In terms of using them, main solar, solar heating, which is um, what we're displacing, typically has a 20% carbon clawback if it's set against the mains gases of fuel. Two separate independent studies validate this. The major report on this was from eight solar heating systems in the UK where the carbon clawback of flat plates averaged 17%. Flat plates are a type of solar heating panel. For evacuated tubes, the supposedly sexier type, averaged 23%. Solar twin had naught because it had a PV pump. For conventional solar, you can move forward 10 steps and slide back to, but for solar twin, for the same 10 that you move forward, you don't slide back in proportion. Graphically illustrated like this. Slide back. Slide back. Slide back, stay there. So it's significantly more sustainable to have 100% solar pumping. But is it really important in terms of carbon break-even? If you look at over 25 years of life in terms of manufacture and operation, low-carbon solar, conventional solar panels which are plugged into the mains, typically take up seven years or so or more to break even in terms of carbon. So it's only seven years after installing them that you can start getting into carbon credit. For zero-carbon solar, less than two years is the figure. Which would you choose? To look at the contexts, do they support photovoltaic pumping? Carbon's a new currency, 
and our view is it does. If you're trying to deliver zero carbon homes, which is the mission of several governments in Europe, it's going to be very hard to do if your solar thermal system is emitting carbon at a power station and back up the line. So why don't you use zero carbon solar? Well, there are arguments against it. There's slightly more pump off time sometimes in summer at low light level. That's when the panel's only slightly warmer than the water at the bottom of the cylinder, largely because the air is heated and there's not enough light to pump the pump. Does it matter? Not a lot, because in winter the pump will always be on if there's any heat to be had. There's the other one, which is use antifreeze, not water. Or oh, that's the argument. Most solar panels contain antifreeze because they're metal, and metal would crack if it was full of water. But antifreeze is six times more sticky than water, and if you're trying to pump stuff, you need to have a stronger pump if it's sticky. So solar electric pumping is much cheaper to do if you pump water rather than sticky antifreeze. If you are pumping water, you need to make sure that your panels can cope with that or the way you drain down your system when it's freezing. And you've got to make sure in some circumstances that you control the water harness properly, which is easy to do. Against, there are some other arguments. It's too much to lose for the rest of the industry. They're making metal panels, they're churning out antifreeze, they're doing things, they've trained loads of people. We don't want to turn around. And in particular, the UK Solar Trade Association appears to be boycotting our technology. They've banned all their members from fitting it and they've taken a training program which was funded by the state worth £86,000 and wrote it with the effect of excluding our technology. But we've had a, an uphill struggle trying to get parts of it included and in the meantime we're getting all our installers ourselves, which unfortunately puts the cost up. There's also a delay in the recognition of the benefits of zero carbon solar. You'd think grant schemes would really be incentivising zero carbon solar over low carbon, but they're not. There are all sorts of breaks on progress taking place, not just at a national level in the UK, but also at a European level. It's sad, but it's what happens in a gold rush. In favour of photovoltaically pumped solar heating, there's the variable speed pumping. That's more subtle and it can give you better performance. So you're also generating low voltage electricity on site, which means you've got the better carbon savings we've discussed. Your system will run during power cuts and you won't need a mains electrician to plumb it in, which can cut the installation cost. If you're using water as a heat transfer medium, you will need less maintenance because there's no antifreeze needed every three years or so, but you may need to control water hardness. Because you don't need a heat exchanger in some of these installations, you can get very cool water at the bottom of your cylinder more often, which means that your pump can be on more often because your panel will be warmer than that more often, which means that you're going to be making better use of the solar panel and you can collect more energy from it. And your capital costs can be less because you'll be using small PVs and pumps. People are very satisfied with Solar Twin. What's on the horizon? Well. Smaller countries like Scotland could probably move forward quite quickly. Maybe within five years all solar heaters could be zero carbon. There's a whole range of zero carbon technologies. Your effect in lobbying could move things forward or backwards. Thank you very much from Barry Johnson with Solar Twin.